Jag ser dem. Men du svarar mig på det. Hon har inte ont mer. Du svarar inte på min fråga. Vem tar hand om det där barnet? Är det änglarna eller Gud eller Satan eller... Bara tomheten? Tomheten, herre? Det kan inte vara så. Se på hennes ögon. Den där stackars medvetande håller på att göra en upptäckt. Tomheten under månen. Nej. Vi står maktlösa med hängande armar. För vi ser det hon ser. Vår skräck och hennes ensamma. Det lilla barnet. Jag gitter inte, jag gitter inte! This is Criteria. Hey everybody, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miras here with my co-host James Mayevsky. That's me. Hello. Uh, And uh, we're here today to discuss... The classic film, uh, The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman. We already talked about his film Wild Strawberries, which, yes. uh, you know, seems to have the reputation of being an, an unusually warm hearted uh, right. film for Bergman. So now I'm getting my introduction to, you know, the yeah. more typical Bergman. And, you know, some vibe. Wild Strawberries make a cameo appearance in this film. Yes, this is before, this is prior to Wild Strawberries. This is 1957. But ah. apparently. They're very important to Bergman, strawberries, and also to Swedish people as kind of a symbol of summer, ah, uh, is what I've heard. I see, I see, um, I see. So they make appearances in a lot of his films, yeah. uh, from my understanding. So uh, we have with us uh, Ruan Jones. Ruan is a multimedia journalist with the Irish Catholic newspaper, and he also uh, speaks about films and uh, other cultural things and also writes about them for a radio show and a corresponding website called The Catholic Index. Uh, welcome to the show, Ruan. Thanks, guys. I'm very pleased to be here. And I do have an American connection, which is that my, my wife is from Illinois, but studied in uh, Seton Hall out in New Jersey. Ah. Uh, and what part of Ireland are you in right now? So I'm I'm in Dublin, the capital, but I'm from Cork originally. Although you might be disappointed that my accent isn't Faith and Megara, um, and that's because apparently cause that accent doesn't really exist, but also because my dad's English, hence Jones, typically Welsh name. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, that is kind of a, a Welsh. Yeah, mm. uh, interesting. So I spent one night in Dublin. And it was awesome. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, I loved it. Um, but, you know, it was kind of just on my way somewhere else. I hate to mm. put it that way. But it, it was, um, I remember looking at, at flights at the time and, and thinking, you know, it'll be cheaper and more pleasant if I just split this trip up and stay one night in Dublin. Mm. And uh, I, 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 ca- I caught some flack from the immigrations officer coming into the country. She was like, you're, you're coming in. For one night. <laughs> well, it, it swings both ways. We we get it when we well, I get it in a way when I go to the go to the states. Now, James, are you an Irish citizen, or do you just no? But okay. I I am um, able to get Irish citizenship through my mother's side of the family. Um, so my mother is an Irish citizen, and I guess I guess there was a, a point at which I don't know if this is still the case, but I guess there was a point when Ireland was was hurting for some uh, some citizenry, and so they 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 expanded. The uh, the pool of eligible um, foreign births is is mm. what it's called. So ah. my my mother is registered in the foreign birth registry. Um, so does she have actually Irish parents? Uh, it was her father's father. Ah, um, okay. I think basically they they extended like if if of a certain 
uh, you know, generation. Yeah. Um, if you're descended from an Irish citizen, you can basically renew that as a foreign birth. So that's the position that I'm in. Mm. Um, unfortunately, after getting all of my paperwork together, uh, basically things got shut down from the lockdown uh, mm. from COVID. So the the office that that I have to submit all of this to in Ireland hasn't been processing these requests for some time. Uh. So uh, who knows if it'll ever happen. <laughs> my, my, my son, uh, Brendan, he is no longer eligible for this because for him to be eligible, I would have had to have become an Irish citizen before he was born. Oh, no. And, and my next child, whoever she, he or she may be, uh, due in May. Yeah, is not looking to be like it's not likely that this child is going to be eligible for it either, <laughs> you know. But hey, you know, it's all in God's hands. Now, one of my roommates has, I think he's an Italian citizen based on a similar kind of policy. Mm. I mean, he's not from Italy, but I think maybe a grandparent yeah. or well, I don't know how something. that makes you feel, Ruan, knowing that I'm like, uh, uh, trying to scheme my way into Irish citizenship without really knowing anything about Ireland or Irish culture, except that I'm descended from, from Irish ancestors. Well, I mean, like the, the, the Irish uh, approach would certainly be similar if, if, if it was discovered that I had any American uh, connection, um, <laughs> would certainly make trips back and forth to, to my parents-in-law a lot, a lot easier. Um, but I, I know right. that one of the things that I found when I, I traveled around America for a couple of months, um, a few years back, and one of the things I found was that people really were eager to like if, to, to create a connection. Like they, they discovered that I'd be Irish and they'd go, oh, my cousins are from Galway or um, my uncle is mm. there. Or I, I visited mm -hmm. there once. And I even had this big burly um, Israeli guy, I think he was, on, on a tour that I was on. And like I, people discovered that I was Irish and everyone was going, oh, this, that relation, that relation. <laughs> And he sort of tapped me <laughs> on the shoulder and he showed me this picture and it was him with this absolutely massive ginger guy. And he said, I visited Ireland, this blacksmith, Ireland. And I was like, <laughs> whoa, that's, uh, that's a different part of Ireland from where I am anyway. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, well, I guess the Irish have, have gone everywhere. Um Particularly America. Yeah, well, but they also say they all, say that Saint Brendan was was here in America before anyone else. Yes, and that's your that's yes his that, son's patron saint. Oh, so, lovely. Yeah. Um, Ruan yeah. is a is a so, saint's name as well from from Munster, and he's famous for um, well, he was one of the twelve apostles of Ireland, so called is the, that's the name they're given. But he got into a cursing match with the, the high kings of Tara, who would have been the the, the sort of regal power at the time, and cursed them so badly that they're their kingdom collapsed or something like that. <laughs> that <is> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how about that? How wow. about that? But uh, we're, <laughs> we're here today to discuss, uh, as, as we said, Bergman uh, and... Uh, well, you know, I just want to say that this film that we're about to talk about ha features some sweet disses, too. It does. It does have a, a match of... Uh, a cursing which, match. Yes, in a, mm. in, a, in a more mundane sense of that word. Yeah. Yes. It's quite an amusing scheme, which uh, gets to the point that this film is a lot more entertaining than I expected it to be. Yeah. Um, you know, we can talk about whether it's ultimately nihilistic, but but uh, it was much more colorful and, and sort of fun to watch throughout. I just, wow, we've got like insane thunder going on right that. now, which yes. is great. It's very appropriate. Great yeah. in this film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I thought the whole film was just going to be like, these two dudes staring at each other for no, the whole I mean, this is the yeah. whole thing. This is the thing that it's it's uh, probably the, quite a warm film in some strange ways because I mean Bergman has this reputation for being a bit of a sort of the stereotype of a dour Swede, um, but right. a lot of the time he is like I don't know if you've seen A Winter Light, which really does just go into the very depths of kind of lacerating, almost self hate I think, um, while also being a searing examination of faithful faithlessness but this film it, it's got quite a sardonic wit to it like early on in the film so so that the, the plot is that um, it's set during the plague times and uh, the knight is returning from disappointed from the crusades to as it turns out come home to um his his wife but uh they they come across a just a random person lying on the ground and his squire goes over to to talk to him and ask directions and he turns him over and of course he's, he's dead he's died from the plague and he comes back, the squire comes back and Antonius Block the night asks him, oh, you know, did he say anything? And he was like, nope, um, oh, really? Uh, and they, they kind of have this interaction at the end. The, the uh, knight asks him 
again along the lines of, well, you know, he must have mustn't have said anything at all. And he went, well, no, I think he was quite eloquent. Uh, he got his message across <laughs> basically, yeah. and it, just that that right. that wit runs. So through. what he had to say was quite gloomy. I think he says, yeah, yeah, yeah or something along the lines, yeah. Um, but it's just there's definitely that that ironic sense of humor, and and Bergman really is like he, he talks about the fact that he you know he thinks that sex is a very important part of his films, and I mean there are some times when whatever it does go to a little bit of crudity and the like, but most of the time what he's what he's really meaning is just that he doesn't just want to appeal to your to your intellect. Um, in the way of someone like, say, I don't know if you've seen Michael Haneke, the director of Code Unknown or Cachet or any of them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. quite a clinical, really intellectual filmmaker. Bergman, he's clearly intellectually quite uh, astute, but really he wants to make films for the senses. And his, his films always have quite a texture to them. They're always hmm. aiming at the gut. Um, even if they do draw from the head, they're really made with the heart. Wow. I think that's, yeah, that's really well put. Um, even from the first moments of this film, right, that's clear mm. uh, because we're given these just very sensuous images of the, the, the ocean, the shoreline, the water hitting the rocks and uh, gulls in the air. And then this voiceover of the book of Revelation. Um, yeah. And the you DS, know, maybe maybe before so we go in. The DS era as well. Sorry. Is, the DS era famously plays at the yeah. start of this and this really booming right. um, at you in yes. your face. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe before we go any further, I, uh, we should just for those listeners who maybe haven't seen the film, give a quick synopsis. Uh, sure. Like you mentioned, Ruan, this is uh, we begin with this knight coming back from the Crusades, um, but he soon in a chess match with death. Yeah. So death comes to take this knight and uh, this knight manages to stave off death a while by having him agree to a chess match uh, for as long as he holds out, he gets to continue to live. And then uh, we move on always returning back to the knight and to this ongoing match with death. But we're also introduced to a whole slew of characters. Uh, it ends up kind of becoming a kind of existential D&D uh, &D session. It's like <laughs> very, very colorful, very colorful characters because yeah. we have the knight's squire who is this very cynical, uh, yeah. uh, you know, kind of like the archetype of the the this the modern man, the cynical atheist or something. Yeah. Um, but then we also have this troop of actors. We can get into them. Uh, we are introduced to some village people um, and, and at a certain point they all end up journeying together. Yeah. Um, but this yeah. is really, and this is happening in the context of the black plague. Right. So yeah. this is really kind of like, I don't know. It also feels a little bit like a, like a post apocalypse apocalypse movie to me. Um, it, it's obviously very apocalyptic in its, in its thematic uh, concerns, uh, you know, right from the very beginning with, with its title seventh seal, you know, but, but going... in, in it's like uh, this like ad hoc, like group forming and yes. people coming in and coming out and the kind of like people journeying together kind of haphazardly. Yeah. And, and really of... making their way through a kind of a wasteland um, right. uh, or at least that's, that's how it feels at times sure, uh, sure. because there's this threat of the plague, but then there's also emptiness and, and devastation. There's um, violence, yeah. uh, people, you know, looting dead bodies yeah, or yeah. a woman being burned at the stake as a witch, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's a, there's like a hostility to the world. Uh, that feels reminiscent of something like like Mad Max or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but I think that perhaps maybe that's enough said about the, yeah. the the plot because really the I think the the heat where the heat is in this film is in its sort of philosophic musings. Um, right. You know, Ruan, it's like you said, uh, Bergman is a very intellectual director and filmmaker here but it's couched within something that's not only very visually striking and entertaining but also just uh yeah it's it's we're it's a it's a fun film to watch yeah. there's moments of humor there's moments of excitement there's 
uh, even some 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 really uh, warm hearted moments of yeah. of uh, you know family life and and romance. Uh, so it, it's really got a little bit of everything. <clears throat> and just uh, just to pick up there on what you yeah. said, compared to Mad Max, and it's it's a sort of curiously ap- appropriate because Bergman considered this a road movie, and I I think a Seventh Seal and um, mm. Wild Strawberries came out in the same year, and both of them are road movies, and you know that's that's, that's obviously right. quite significant in film terms yeah. it's about a journey and it's it's obviously got a, a metaphor for life and that kind of thing and what's what's yeah. curious about this particular road or journey that they're on is as you say the landscape that they go through which is like a wasteland but it's also a landscape which isn't defined spatially in terms or uh, in relation to each other so like they're on a beach at the start then they are going sort of walking along and it's it's sort of clear that it's near the cliff coast but it, you don't know have they traveled a day? Have they traveled half an hour? And then they suddenly come across a village. They come across a church. They come across, um, like, they come home. Like they, they clearly are traveling distances, but we've no sense of the time that they're traveling through. We've no sense mm-hmm. of where things are in relation to each other. It's very much a, a subjective landscape, which is why I think you, you feel mm-hmm. it quite strongly. And, yeah, just, just at a basic level, it is an enjoyable film because it has a good hook. Um, you know, you think, oh, it's going to be about death, but you don't think that, there's actually going to be death in it, as it were, that death is a character, but not only a character, he's sort of the narrative, he's, he's sort of the, the MacGuffin, as, as Hitchcock would have called it, that, you know, this game of chess with death is going on, and you're wondering, how is this going to be resolved? So even when you have these meanderings and these philosophical musings and the like, there's still a story that's gently driving things forward and with a kind of clear narrative conclusion to them, that you know that at some point they've got to resolve how this game of chess with death is going to finish. Right. Yeah. Should we talk about the the setting at all? I mean, it's it's a medieval yeah. film. I don't know how hard it's trying for, you know, historical accuracy. Clearly, as you said, like the Squire character is very conspicuously, he's like, oh, he, he refers to himself as being modern, you yeah. know, mm. in the film, a uh, modern person. And, uh, you know, we've got the plague so uh where does that situate us uh what 1300s or yeah yeah mid 1300s i think yeah and and yet then we've got um you know we've got witch burnings which were really more of a like a 15th century and later kind of thing that was really more of a protestant thing i'm 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 not saying that it never happened you know in uh, catholic places but uh but it was sort of frowned upon uh, generally. There's a lot of documented, you know, condemnations of that sort of thing from bishops and popes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so uh, that comes in a little bit later. I'm sure that there was – there must have been some degree of scapegoating, you know, mm-hmm. as there always is, you know, yeah, as right. we see now, you know. Uh, uh, but um, – I think – And then uh, – Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think the so the, the origins for sort of the imagery, I'm just going to try and find a quote here from Bergman himself, but just to, to, the, the origins for the imagery as he saw it were from the churches that he used to go with. So actually just a little bit of background about Ingmar Bergman. So he's, he's a Swedish filmmaker, born 1918, died 2007. He was the son of an exceptionally strict um, and rather austere yeah. Lutheran minister who would take him and I think his brother around with him when he'd go around to different parishes and preach in their, in their communities and in their churches and the like. And what Bergman says is that this film is drawn from memories he has of looking up at the paintings and the icons mm-hmm. in the churches, which actually include an image of a man playing chess with death. Um, but also, yes, this is by Albertus Pictor, okay. uh, who is kind of like a, a character in the film. I don't know if mm. it's really supposed to be literally that guy, but there's a guy who's called Pictor, like Paintor, you know, you know, uh, and paint, Paintor, paint, Painter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he he's kind of a reference to that artist. And so he had a fresco in the 1480s that he did of a knight playing chess with death. And that's where the idea for the film mm. came from. Go on. Yeah, it's interesting to talk about. Uh, his his father being this men, this really harsh minister because I think that that certainly plays into wild strawberries too. Uh, uh, I think we talked about it a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it was very harsh. Like he would, you know, if he wet the bed, he would be locked into locked into a closet for hours as punishment. Yeah. Um, and you know, his mother was very domineering, but it turned out later she was having an affair for a year. I think for years, uh, and so all this 
horrible stuff in his childhood that he's kind of grappling with and very much bound up with religion, I think. Mm. His father was a chaplain at the Royal Hospital at a Royal Hospital okay. of some kind. And uh, uh and it says here that when he was six year old six years old, Bergman used to help the gardener carry corpses from the hospital Whoa. to the mortuary. Uh so wow. these are all kind of death and you know religion <laughs> yeah. and all this all this stuff um but yeah so and, and his the relationship with his mother is, is pretty important because i mean maybe this is something that we'll come back to a bit later but like marian imagery um, plays a key role in this film um but also just in all bergman's films women are the sort of the conduit through which he he sees the world and expresses his his metaphors for beauty faith um mm -hmm. and and various different things and i mean in his own life, he was married five times, had nine children and um, multiple mistresses. Um, so he had quite a, a difficult relationship with women, I think, in a sense, sort of revering them um, while also never being able to actually live with them um, and probably mm. mistreating them to a great degree. And I mean, one of the actresses, I think it might be B.B. Anderson or Harriet Anderson, was asked, yeah. you know, why did you work for him? I mean, he, he wasn't great to women. And she said, but he wrote brilliant parts for women. And I mean, that's the thing. He's, he's a remarkable uh, ability to invest his, his female characters with life and um, sort of vivacity that they're just not offered in, in most other type of, of films. Yeah, he and B.B. Anderson were in a, in a relationship at the time that this film was made and, and Wild Strawberries. Uh, I might as well just throw this in here, too, so we can just have it as a data point. It's like he used to sign, right? His, uh, you know, he was clearly like kind of rebelling against his childhood religion later on, but he used to uh, write uh, at the end of his scripts, uh, SGG for Soli Deo Gloria, which is the same mean, you know, to God alone, the glory, wow. uh, which is the same thing that Bach used to, d used to wow. do. Probably <laughs> he got the idea from yeah. Bach and, um, yeah. And uh, he said that he, in some way, uh, anonymously, objectively, has done this for the glory of God and would like to give it to him as it, as it is. And in fact, at the very end of this film, we hear the choir. I didn't pick this up on my first viewing on the second viewing, the choir at the very end, as we see the, um, you know, the uh, actor and his wife going off, uh, there's like a little harp thing. And then there's a choir singing Soli Deo Gloria, <laughs> actually, wow. uh, which is interesting because it seems like a very nihilistic film and kind of atheistic, but then I don't know what to make of the fact that an, and and you know there's there's comments that he made about why he made this film and what he was trying to work through about death uh that we can get to later but yeah i don't know there's a lot of complexity in his perspective i guess yeah and it, like i i tend to take anything that he says bergman himself says with a bit of a pinch of salt just because he was a storyteller and a little bit like orson welles i think he couldn't stop telling stories even when they were about himself so i know that one of his biographers says that you know some of the things he says that happened to him more likely actually happened to his brother or didn't actually happen at all. So, I mean, of course, they still have a great deal of relevance to his films because to an extent it's what he believed. But even with Faith, like I know, I, I was watching an interview with Max von Sydow who stars as Antonius Bloch in this film and was also one of um, his repartees, his, his, his um, staple actors, who said that, that he, von Sydow, didn't believe in the afterlife and he told this to Bergman later on in life and Bergman said, oh no, I, I think there's something there all right. And um, he even said that, um, hmm. Fonsido said, well, when you go there, will you, will you, will your spirit come back to me and, and speak to me? And Bergman said, yes, I, I will. And, and in this interview, Fonsido was that the, the interviewer, of course, asked, and, and does he come back to you? And Fonsido said, he does. Um, so, I mean, Whoa. Oh, I don't know, like, I mean, what do you make of that? I don't know. <laughs> Von Sydow wow. said Dude, that, those Swedes, man. Yeah, I mean, Von Sydow wouldn't talk about what he, what he, what they discussed when he comes back because he felt it was too personal. But I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of the complexity that you're dealing with here. And I mean, I know that Bergman wow. talks about how he's, one of the artists, I think, talks in, in the film, um, talks about how he's, he's sort of haunted by angels and demons and he can't help bring them out. And I mean, that was, that was um, Bergman's sort of approach as well as an artist was that he seems to have been haunted by by angels and demons in some sense that he just he, and he couldn't he couldn't reject them even if he wanted to he, he couldn't reject that part of him himself. Yeah, it's an interesting line um, because uh, this this line that you're referring to is uh, 
during the first sequence when we've been introduced to this this troupe of actors and they're all quite endearing in their own ways. There's mm-hmm. three of them. Uh, there's the one who's the director of the troupe, uh, kind of like a, a salty guy uh, who might be involved in this for ulterior motives. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the other two are a married couple, uh, a man and a Yoff and, and Mia, which are diminutives of Joseph and Mary. Mm-hmm. Oh, Just mm-hmm. throw good that catch. In there. Good catch. And they have a son, Mikhail, yeah. uh, a baby boy. I don't think that's a diminutive of Jesus, as far as I, as far as I know. <laughs> but um, uh, but he has these visions. Mm. Uh, we see him get up in the morning. He goes out, throws some water on his face. But in short order, he's seeing a vision of the Blessed Mother with the infant Jesus. Uh, and it lasts only a moment, but he goes back into the wagon and wakes up his wife and tells her all excitedly that he's seen the Blessed Mother. Yeah. And, um she alludes to the fact that this is a repeated occurrence for him, that he often sees these visions and, and that they're not real. Um, and he says something to the effect of, it's, it's not the reality you can see. It's a different kind. Mm. And, and then later in that same scene, he says, you know, I can't help it if angels and demons enjoy my company. Yeah, that's what it and is. And I yeah. just kind of thought, you know, anytime I heard an artist speaking – um, you know, I, I couldn't help but think about, you know, t- to the degree, to what degree is Bergman putting his, his thoughts as an artist, his words as an artist into these characters? Cause we're, that scene is almost immediately contrasted by the knight and the squire arriving at this chapel where right. a, a painter is painting yeah. and talking about his art and what it's doing. Yeah. So we, we've at this point, you know, I, I realize I'm putting a lot out there, but at this point, very early on in the film, we have three different artists yeah. talk about their craft in a different way because we've got Yoff talk about, talking about this sort of invisible reality that he's aware of. Yeah. We've got the um, the the director of the troupe. Scat. Scat, yeah. Um, talk about, uh, well, talk about his kind of cynical approach to, 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 performance uh yeah. and then we have the painter talk about it yeah and what's interesting too uh, and this will be the last thing i'll say on this point is just that uh scott and the painter are both talking about depicting death in their art and like what is the fruit of that so whereas the the theater the actor the director of the troupe says you know why would i go around scaring people um you know, much better to put on a body play, mm. but it's the priests who deal in in death and and terror. It, but I, I think the painter says, "Yeah, go no, ahead." No, no, finish, finish your thought, and I'll come back. Just the the painter says uh, something different. A skull is more interesting than a naked woman. Yeah, or almost as interesting <laughs> yeah. as a naked woman, and he yeah. says that uh, you know it makes people think. And the squire says, "Yeah, think." And then run into the arms of the priests. And he says, "Well, what they do after they, what they do is their business, mm. you know." But it's just a different uh, yeah. sort of take on the same sort of uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. You know, it would be interesting to compare that painter with the painter in A Hidden Life. Yeah, I, I've, I've and, of course thought of and that. Andrei yeah. Rublev, where he's talking about much. Oh, why do I want to just make these things that scare people? Totally, totally. Uh, in Andrei Rublev. Yeah, but please, Ruan, yeah, no, you're going to say something because. Um, you're you're very you're very much right in this that there's there's s- several reflections on on the nature of art and the artist's relation to the truth, um, and as you say, there's the exceptionally um, cynical Scath who just doesn't really he doesn't really care about the relationship to the truth. He just wants to entertain, um, and he just wants to do so to make money. And then you have the visionary who is Yof, uh, y- Joseph, who can't help but be visited by inspiration by his muses by the angels mm-hmm. and demons he's always coming up with songs and even though he's a fool like he's sort of the court jester he's also one of the more profound characters in the story and also one of the most sane um and then yeah. there's as you say there's the artist reflecting on truth and then what's what happens then is that in a certain sense um bergman brings these three different perspectives to life in the key sequence where the performers, the, the troupe, give their first and only performance, in which you have three different mm-hmm. plays, as it were, take place. 
first you have the performers and they're given this sort of, I don't know, it's, it seems to be a kind of bawdy tale, maybe a morality tale, I'm not sure. But what's clear is that Yoff is playing this character who's being belittled by Scat and his wife Mia. This is in character in a play. Um, and he's playing some sort of ass. And it's, it's clearly a, a, a sketch in some sense. Then you have the Yoff and Mia singing this song about uh, a chicken. And, Which is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really quite song. a funny sequence. But what's going on at the, the same time is that Scat and a local woman are, um, I mean, I don't know how to put it, getting it off, basically, or getting it on even, um, yeah. in the background. And it's in the most, it's played in a deliberately kind of almost grossly um, carnal fashion, like they're chewing on, mm. on chicken, they're like tearing it apart and stuff. And it's, it's really showing sort right. of the comedy of life, as it were, or the, the tragic comic element of life. And that's kind of Scat, like Scat is becoming what he says he wants to put on, which is the body tail and then finally you have mm. the the last element which is the performance of the flagellants who come through with their incense their crosses and obviously beating themselves and each other with with birch trees and you get this fantastic monologue from i don't yeah. know what he is a priest or a, a brother or a pastor about the the damnation that everyone's facing and i mean it's a really quite odd in the way that these things always are odd, that he's talking about how everyone's facing damnation and justification and or and and God's justice and wrath, but that we should be thankful that we're saved and we should be want to save and keep going. But it's just three fantastic um, performances laid against each other about the different like so this is right. this is the what what Bergman sees anyway is or what the the artist uh, no the squires it sees as a sort of what the priests do they're they're pushing them, um, the people into their arms. And it's it's a false yeah. performance. I mean, so there there those are just three interesting ways in which he brings those sort of debates about art to life. Well, it's also interesting because the song that they do, uh, that Yoff and Mia just do together, is about the plague. Mm. You know, it's kind of making light of it, but they keep talking about the black one, who I think it's supposed to be the plague or maybe death. death. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but it's kind of absurd. It's kind of an absurd song. Right. Um, and then it kind of merges into this uh, more serious taking right. the plague more. There's like two ways of coping with it. There's right. like taking it really, really seriously and kind of like making light of it mm -hmm. to, to deal with it. Um, but uh, yeah, this this flagellant sequence is really it's kind of like repulsive, you know, sure. repulsive, repulsive. Um, I'm not like. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like a, a disgusting spectacle in a yeah. way, you yeah. know, Um these people beating themselves and weeping and wailing and groveling in the dirt. And it's like, uh, you know, in theory, all of those things are legitimate <laughs> responses to right. a plague. But like, I still like, uh, maybe, maybe the, maybe you would have had the same response to, uh, you know, the, the repentance of Nineveh, but like, uh, but it's still the way it's presented in this film. I think we're meant to be like a little bit disgusted by yeah. it, but I think maybe we're also meant to be allowed to sort of, think on it a little more and see like well maybe taking this seriously is like a good thing yeah. rather than just distracting yeah. well, yourself and from I, it i think it's also um sort of uh sort of destabilized a bit because of this monologue that we're given you know it's it's just he just goes through he just like insults the people yeah just like just tears them down um you know really really like laying into these yeah, people and, face so and so and yeah you, right right face, so and so, so. So if that weren't the case, right, if, if it were someone who instead de instead delivered like a really compelling sermon on death, uh, then maybe we would have a different response to this right. whole sequence. Right. But but the fact that it's sort of like capped with this just totally like he just berates them. Um, and the performance is amazing. Like mm. and also it really lets the language shine. Yes. He's know? like rolling his R's yeah. and like. Trilling his eyes, yeah. Yeah, really, really good stuff. I mean, I, I yeah. think I, oh. I'd slightly disagree in that I, I think that whole sequence is meant to be entirely condemnatory of that particular type of religion, um, mm. which, I, I mean, I, and I, to, to extent, I think it's fair enough in that it's, it's, it's a bit of a slightly, at least the way it's brought out here, it's a slightly Gnostic, as in, you know, we're all sort of, we're all the dung heap on which God just lays this white snow that, to make us look pretty. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas, well, in fact, the flagellants were uh, sorry, not to interrupt, but like the the flagellants were, I read on Wikipedia, 
uh, that that stuff was more common in kind of like various heretic well, this is heretical the thing. Yeah, so, sects in the Middle so Ages. I, I, I mean, I think I think that that's that's more what he's getting. I don't think he don't know if he means that. Maybe this is meant to be his vision of religion and how it should all be condemned. But for me, it's condemning a particular type of Gnostic faith, which really um, tears down. I mean, this is what I mean about the strange contradictions of your man's speech at the end, where he tears everyone down as worthless and less than nothing. And yet we actually should want to keep living. And sort of like, like yeah. what, where does that make sense? I, I don't really quite, it doesn't make sense. And yeah. that's the point of that sequence, right. I think, is that yeah. that type yeah. of But I think one of, the other, one of the other things that's articulated so clearly to me in this sequence is the power of these gestures and signs and the incense and the skulls mm. and the, the, you know, the crowns of thorns, you know, that, that, like and the people are losing it, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. and uh, people fall to their knees, and you know, it's like that's theater, yeah. right? Like it, we've 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 <laughs> just seen some theater, and a guy got a you know a fruit thrown at his face, yeah. yeah. But like that, that is something. Um, yeah, wow. And so, so you know, that's I, there's like it's definitely there's definitely that performative element to it. I mean, it's it's definitely three contrasting performances: the the stage play itself the comic song and then the the flagellants. And I mean I, I do just think that it's 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 a wonderful, wonderful sequence. And again it's it's just mm. he's a rare ability to bring these ideas to life in a way that's entertaining. And I mean it might be shocking and uh, a bit grotesque, yeah. but it's definitely entertaining. Right. Yeah. And then that's the only side of the church that you do see in this film mm. it's like that and the the witch burning um and the references to just like the priests having all this power and scaring people yeah and, and, and every uh, time a priest does speak it actually turns out to just be death yeah you know hiding behind the priest's cloak um, um so it, it's, yeah, i think there's one monk that he talks oh, to when right. they first right. encounter but yeah. there's, yeah. there's also there's, uh, there's the, the the former seminarian who um, tripped That's right. Oh, yeah. on the crusade in the first place and who is now now I think seminarian means something different in this context not, see, than what we think yeah I, I, I don't necessarily uh, I think he was already a cleric of some kind whether he was a deacon or what yeah. I don't think he was a seminarian in the modern sense no, that's, that's he said point. I knew you from the seminary but he refers to him as being a doctor like right. a teacher of some kind so what's, um, yeah I mean what's, I think, what's clearly implied is that he was sort of a man of God who has now turned to robbery it's an attempted rape a preacher of the crusade yeah a preacher of the crusade um, and like he's he, turned from all those things to this most base character and he's he's the real villain in the, the whole story I think that's right um, he's the only yeah. unredeeming yeah. character without any redeeming feature but the, the the sort of like positive spiritual references we get are with this visionary actor you know well, um, I mean, it's it's interesting how these there's there's a connection, I think, clearly between this actor and the knight, mm. you know, the knight is this guy who's seeking God. He's trying to find proof. He wants to see something and know that it's real. And he does see death. And then the actor is this and he's this really complicated guy. And then the actor is this really totally simple guy who just sees these things and he's not looking for them. And you you don't even know like how much he actually kind of like thinks about them or reflects on them, but it just seems to be something that is part of his identity. And this is just part of who he is. Uh, and he's almost comfortable with it. Uh, and he, he's just like wide eyed, this beautiful wide eyed performance yeah. by this actor. Yeah. Um, who was a comic in real and, life. And uh, he was, he was a stand. Oh, yes. Yeah. He's a comic. What, one, what, just to, oh, really? just to pick That's up cool. on what you're saying there, one of the things I noticed this time around, it must be my fourth or fifth time watching this film, was that when he, after he's seen the vision of the Virgin Mary, he off talks about how there is this stillness. I don't know if he says the word silence, but it seems to be implied that comes over him. And I mean, the theme of this, this movie is the seventh seal. It references the seventh seal when there's silence in heaven after half an hour after the seal is broken. So it's, it's a film which sort of, teachers on the edge of nihilism it's about silence although there's earnest seeking but what i thought interesting in this kind and of, in this situation is that you know there's a kind of stillness and silence which yof experiences which is actually a sign of a very healthy faith and there's a stillness and silence in the, the night's experience which actually just comes from him just being too clenched up and and not receptive enough yeah. to what's around him whereas wow um yof is accidentally so just instinctively so 
That's really, yeah. I, Yoff mentions it again later when they're in the forest. It's at night. The moon has come out and they're all kind of, it's this kind of ghostly moment when they're all looking up in the sky and there's this sense of foreboding. And Yoff remarks on the stillness of things. And gee, I wish I could remember. Uh, I think it might be the squire who so, sort of uh, contradicts him somehow. And I think it's the smith who clarifies what he means by by the stillness mm. that that there's. Oh, like, I'm totally blanking yeah, on what this you're is, talking it's, about. It's an odd it's an odd moment because um, it's not really connected to any specific uh, like plot point. I think it's immediately preceding maybe uh, when we see the. Uh, it's it's the last encounter. The seminarian dies. It, yeah, it's, 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 is it either before the seminarian dies or else it's connected with the sequence where they escape death, Yorf and Mia. Yes, um, right. And he, when right. he, when he, but it's one of these times yeah. when they're they're in the woods. It's at night. They're they're camped. Um, and uh, yeah, there's this stillness and uh, longing for something to break the silence. Like if only we heard the wind through the trees or the voice of of something. I think the squire says other than our other than our own mm, or something yeah. like that. You know. So it's also this reflection on like a cosmic silence. Um, but but I, I wish um, there, there's this connection between the, the knight and the the actor and and his family. And the knight is looking for he's also not just looking for knowledge, but he's also looking for a meaningful act before he dies. And that's mm. part of why he is delaying death. And he finds his meaningful act in saving this family in helping this family and and delaying death so that they can escape. And. But you almost wish that uh, he and the night, uh, he and the actor would have a conversation mm. about yeah these things because he's going to this young girl who's going to be burned for supposedly, uh, you know, in, having intercourse with Satan and and uh, and he's like, oh, have you seen the devil? Like, can you tell me about him? Like, you know, because surely he must know know if God is real. And he's like at, trying to seeking knowledge from her, and she can't help him and uh and he never asked we never see him asking the you know there's some reference to it i think even in his presence when they first meet that he sees things mm. uh but but he never asks him about like his visions or anything uh so you kind of re it's kind of regret you regret that it doesn't go in that direction where he's yeah i, th I think that the, yeah. the thing with bergman that's key to understand is again his relationship with women and i mean it comes out more strongly in a winter light, which is about a Swedish pastor, Pastor Eriksson, who has lost his faith and over the course of an afternoon sort of comes to terms with that. And it's a really, it's not a, you know, it's it's not a very good film in the end because it's it's sort of the dour, humorless, self-hating side of Bergman, which I, I just don't find very entertaining. But it does contain some really interesting metaphors. And what comes through is that women and his relationship with women or the the, the male character's relationship with women stand for their views on faith. So in this case, Pastor Erickson lost his faith pretty much at the same time as his first wife dies, whom he loves, who he, he clearly loved dearly and who can't be replaced for him. And the connection is that his sort of idealized and youthful faith was lost when this woman died. And I mean, in the seventh seal or seventh seal, this comes through again, not quite as strongly, but what comes through is that he really was searching for a Marian aspect to his faith, which is, is clearly quite lacking from, from his own, Bergman's own life, and also from sort of the, the cinema, the film world. Um, but where, where I think the importance with that this comes through in, in A Seventh Seal is in the fact that the, the wife of the, that, so the wife of the, the of Jof, the traveling player, and the interactions that they have, that they, they, Antonius Block says to her something along the lines of faith is like um, loving a person that you can't see and um, loving a woman that you can't see. And I think that there's this key sequence at the end then when he returns to his castle and his wife is actually there. Yeah. And so this woman that he's been loving without seeing for, for 10 years is there and she's tending the fire. And it's really quite an odd sequence to me because it seems to me that it could be a perfect symbol for um, faith, like a solid faith, that this idea of um, loving someone that you can't see who is actually 
tending the heart, like the, the center of your being, your home. Um, but it's not played that way. Whereas I think with the family that he sees, Yof and Mia, they're clearly uh, a stand in for the holy family. And I think also a stand in for mm -hmm. a healthy, hearty, very incarnate type of faith. Because one of the things you say, is, or one of the things you point out, is that the only time priests and religion really come in is, is in the sort of context of their power. There's no sacramental side to the religion at all, which is why it feels such a Protestant religion. And I mean, the two things that it's missing then, or the two things that I think Bergman really missed, was the, the sacramental, the really incarnate side of the religion, and then the feminine, the maternal side of the religion, which, I mean, in a creaturely sense, is the, the uh, maternal, the incarnational, the, the procreative source of life raised to uh, the supernatural level in Our Lady. So, I mean, he's really searching for Mary. And I think in the seventh seal, it's, it's where he comes closest to finding her in that vision, that beatific vision of the Virgin leading the child. And then obviously with the associations with Yof and Mia, the, the sort of the holy family who are then the only two people who escape death in this case. I mean, I think in the end, it's actually a film that validates or... Um, shows a victorious faith, even though I think the knight in the end doesn't get it. Um, the the sort of existence of faith is is validated in a way that Bergman possibly didn't even intend. And I know he talks about how he was working through his fear of death, and that in some sense the sort of the, the childish connection he had to his faith that that remnant is still there in a seventh seal, whereas it's lost in a winter light. But even though it is from his childhood. I don't think it's necessarily childish because I, I really do think Yof and Mia demonstrate a really profound and um, I mean, I think deeply Catholic since I, since that's where we're coming from a deeply Catholic faith, yeah. um, which for me in a way outshines all the, the nihilism of the rest of the sequences. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the Marian aspect being missing. We do see Mary at the beginning of the film, but you know, given that the name, the two characters, uh, the the actor and his wife are referring to Joseph and Mary, uh, it's Yoff who has these visions, but there's not the corresponding side of it with Mia. Is she doesn't believe, you know, uh, she doesn't reject him, but she she doesn't believe in his visions. So there's not the same sort of like. Mia is not as Marian as Yaf is. No, but Josephine, she, she is devoted, I guess. devoted to him and loves him and and follows him. And when he has the vision of death, she does trust him, and and they leave together. Um, yeah, there's um, a very interesting book by a, a Catholic, well, he was a Jewish convert to Catholicism and a psychoanalyst called Carl Stern. But he wrote this book, Flight from Woman, which I really recommend reading, in which he theorizes that the modern age has or is constantly in a flight from the feminine. And he psychoanalyzes a number of different writers and he sort of psychoanalyzes phenomenological lens through them, very biographical like Nietzsche, um, Descartes, uh, Hedda Gabler for, for Ibsen and things like this. And I think there's a similar reading and the, the point that he's making is that most of these people were estranged from their mothers at an early age and didn't experience love from their mothers at an early age at that point in their life when a mother's love is sort of all encompassing, when they don't see a difference between themselves and their mother, that first sort of six months or so. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, Bergman talks in the documentary and later in his life about how he was quite a needy child, is, is roughly how he puts it, that he, he cried a lot and he wanted a lot of attention from his mother. But she actually rejected this to the point that she took him to a psychologist to cure him of this sort of girlish habit. Um, and then he talks about how his mother was, was power hungry, that she wanted to always be involved. But when his father beat them, she wouldn't get involved. She'd stay away. So like for me, for, for him, he um, had this kind of inversion of the ideal mother who wants to be powerful when she, controls it, when she can control things, but doesn't want to come to his protection or receive him. And I think there's definitely this, this idea of rejecting the receptive quality of femininity like that that feminine virtue that you know that the knight embodies this to a certain extent because he's not receptive he's very much he wants things on his own terms he kind of wants to to conquer or to take like he, he doesn't want mm. to just accept a uh, faith as a, as a gift freely given from god and i mean that, that i think is what Bloch sees in the relationship between Joff and mia he sees their faith in each other but i think he he recognizes something unconsciously in 
in Mia's beauty and in in Yof's faith. Yeah. Can I pull these two threads together and ask you guys what you make uh, the the one thread of uh, the, the the feminine in this film and the other thread of stillness and silence um, and ask you guys what you think of this mute character who the squire rescues from being raped and murdered, but who who travels with them and then at the end get, delivers this sort of final line before they're all taken by death. Do you, you know this character I'm referring yeah. to? Yeah, I yeah. mean, she's she's a beautiful woman, and so her presence is very striking throughout. But she never she never speaks right up until the end. Mm. And I I didn't quite know what to make of this, but I wonder if it doesn't have something to do with these two elements that we've been talking about with the feminine and with with the yeah. stillness. What I thought of that character is that so in in the think of the couple of scenes that she's sort of key in. So there's the burning of the witch, and you know they're all. They've, they've sort of been discussing the, the Antonius Block has been talking to her and he's given her some sort of um, anesthetizing drug or whatever it is that that'll help her not experience the pain of the burning. Um, but at the end of that scene, as they're all that troop is traveling away, the silent girl comes back and she stands beneath the cross or the, the, the burning cross as it effectively is and looks up at her in this sort of distraught, this mute distress. And then later on, you have the death of the seminarian, we'll just call him that for the minute, where he's dying from the, the Black Plague and all he wants is a drink of water. And again, it's this mute girl who is, she, she grabs the water and she wants to give it to him, but the squire stops her. And I think in some sense, she's, she stands for a kind of mute compassion, just compassion as such, a desire to help uh, and to be helpful to people. And I mean, it's interesting that the squire stops her and, and tries to soothe her. He, he, he tells her, I'm trying to help you. It's meaningless. It won't help. It won't make a difference. Your desire to help is, is, is not going to help at all, actually. And you're just hurting yourself. I very much agree with, with, with everything that you've said here. I, I kind of felt that her, her sort of efficacy as, as um, a character you know, whether she's, uh, you know, meant to represent, like you said, compassion as such or what have you. I felt like it was a little diluted at the end when she's given this 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 really seemingly unearned central role in like the consummation of this death of, mm -hmm. of the whole group. Because everybody's having their response to death arriving at the castle. And it's very interesting the way everyone responds. And... Um, Frankly, I think it's really encouraging that the knight, Antonius Block, is praying to God and, and asking for mercy. And mm -hmm. so I, I think, okay, cool, score. Um, but score. but she, she gets on her knees and almost welcomes death with a yeah. kind of, um, there's like a serenity. But more than that, there's almost like a... a a happiness mm. um it's yeah. it's almost as if she's happy to see death and then right. she says it is finished and i and i just kind of i couldn't help but feel like like is this bergman just like finding a stopgap you know like just not able to to really represent like a profound peace in the face of death and and just sort of looking to this to be that that kind of uh, placeholder. I I, I'm I don't not know. Sure. I took it. I mean, you go, Thomas. All right. First of all, we can say about the character that like she uh, she's clearly like a very traumatized character, you know. Yeah. And so I I took it like on a character level as like she's welcoming death because she's looking for something something yeah. else. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Than what she's experienced. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, quite know what to make. It's very powerful. Her performance is great in that scene. Um, it's very striking and kind of like ties the, the scene together, but, um, I'm not sure what to make of that. And, and also like when, when, uh, Yoff afterwards has his vision of death leading the dance in the distance and he names the people who are in the dance, she's not among those people. Whoa. She, uh, the witch and uh or alleged witch and um the wife Whoa. none of them are in the dance did, uh, did you count i i this if this is true i t completely missed yes. that 
Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the seminarian, everybody else who was in the room when death came at the end was in the group. Not and the seminarian. Yes. He's mentioned Rav- Ravon or whatever oh, really? he's mentioned. Yeah. Oh. So he, he is mentioned as not having been, he wasn't with them at the time. Yeah. He's mentioned, uh, and everybody else in the room, uh, are not, uh, but the wife and the, um, huh. the mute girl are mentioned. I was reading this essay by a critic named Gary Giddens, and he had a couple of suggestions as to why this might be. He said, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't mean, I mean, it's pretty clear that they are all taken by death, but why are they not led in this like sort of dance, compulsory dance by death? And he, he suggests that it, it may be that it's because neither, those are the two characters who don't seem to be afraid of death, who seem to be like welcoming of death. Yeah. And then uh, the other suggestion was that um maybe it's because Yoff uh it's Yoff's vision and maybe he's just not, you know, thinking about them. He's never seen the wife, you know, yeah. and hasn't really interacted with the yeah, maybe so. uh the mute girl. Hmm. I wonder, uh so but it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I mean I wonder if something as simple as they didn't have enough actors to get them all into the shot <laughs> because it was it was shot on the hoof. They they only they they were filming or they're finishing up filming for the day and he just saw this light over the hilltop and he grabbed like the grips the camera boys or whatever just told them to go up there oh wow that's that's how that actual oh, interesting that final shot came to be so that's yeah, great i wonder could it be something as simple as that i i, I don't know huh. oh well yeah very interesting well one, one thing that like i you know just to sort of uh in closing on on all of these things that we've been talking about is that one thing that I think Bergman is really successful with in this film is representing a complexity of perspectives and not sort of giving an undue amount of weight to one or the other. I mean, I think you can say that that perhaps the perspective of, of true faith is underrepresented, um, but that's that wouldn't necessarily be a surprise, nor is it, you know, the whole story because there there is these glimpses throughout you know and so whether it's talking about art or it's talking about faith ex- ex- death existence yeah you know there the the film continues to inhabit and and this multiplicity of perspectives and viewpoints that that like really invites in the best possible way i think you know this kind of intellectual engagement um and it is it's a little bit a little bit of yeah. a of a Rorschach test too. Um this is the way uh, a previous guest of ours described the Decalogue films, but you do end up kind of seeing a little bit of what you're able to put into it. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, the knight himself is kind of c- c- conflicted from the get go because he's talking about when he's in the church and trying to make his confession to who he thinks is a priest, but is actually the uh the death, death yeah. pretending to be a priest or a monk and um well there's a couple of interesting aspects because he refers to his indifference to people being uh the source of his problems which i i don't really see in the film that he's indifferent to people i, I well, guess that didn't come through for me i i, I think um it, like i think he's kind of he's quite a passive character like if, if you look at it the squire is the one who really does stuff i mean even right. with the with the the girl Even dying, he's the cynic, the the yeah. witch dying on the, the the fire, like it doesn't save her, like he doesn't intervene to try and protect her, right? Um, he just and it's the squire who says, "I had thought about killing the soldiers, but yeah. she's that's about so to die in, that's anyway. so interesting." But yeah, yeah, you're right. The knight is he's like he's like affected by everything, but he doesn't actually like reach out yeah. and do things. That's right. like a really great point. Yeah, like he's moved by everything. He's he's. Yeah, Torn but ironically, the squire, who is seemingly unaffected by everything, goes out and and intervenes. That's fascinating. So it's like, yeah, he's like he's stuck in himself. But anyway, he's saying like, you know, I want to see God. I wish God would reveal himself to me. But he's also saying, I wish I could tear God out of my heart. Mm, you know, it's yeah. like he's mocking me. He won't he won't leave, but he won't reveal himself to me either. Um, and uh, I don't know. Bergman has talked in interviews about trying to. Uh, to purge this idea of God in a similar way. And even like in his films, like, like he, he, he says that, uh, he says that he, he had to purge himself of the old idea of God as a father, 
uh, and like a god of security is how he d- describes it. Um, and uh, so so he says there's like a period where he's like in a period of rebellion against this idea in his films. And then there's films like Wild Strawberries where he's like accepting it in order to be finally reconciling with it in order to be finally rid of it. Hmm. Uh, and and so he says something kind of interesting, too, about the seventh seal in particular being like his way of writing himself out of his fear of death. Mm. He he's, he just he said it. He said it's like the separation between the knight and Yuns, uh, meaning the um, the squire is yeah. Yuns, the rationalist and the seeker. After that, the religious problem left me in peace for a long time. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm not sure what to make of that. But but then he later says in an interview, he's asked, I think in the 70s by journalists, like uh, on his thoughts on death, and he says. I was afraid of this enormous emptiness, but my personal view is that when we die, we die, and we go from a state of something into a state of absolute nothingness. And I don't believe for a second that there's anything above or beyond or anything like that. And this makes me enormously secure, <laughs> which is kind of like odd because he just said that like was criticizing like the idea of God as father as being just like a construct for your own security. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but then as you say, you brought up this thing, Ruan, where he said that he did believe there was something after death. So yeah. according to Max von Sydow. I mean, so, he, like, it's um, not surprised that he had such a conflicted view on religion, given that his father was a pastor, but also yeah. cr- quite cruel to him, who would have preached, I presume, some vision of mercy from God from the altar, but then in his practice with his children was quite cruel to them. And then again, that, that maternal quality that he, he missed out on, you know, the idea that he would have had of a, a wonderful and caring mother and the actual fact of his mother rejecting his needs as, as being in some mm-hmm. way a, a malfunction. Uh, I mean, he's, he's mm-hmm. obviously had quite a, a twisted worldview as a result of that. And I mean, I, I've always hoped that he's been saved in some sense, that he's like the, the knight that even if he, he can't quite find out or can't quite believe in some sense he's still an earnest seeker and he'd still appeal to God for mercy and would have made some sort of confession as it were. I mean, I, I do have some hope that he, uh, that he did turn to God. And I, I, I just, as I say, I take everything he says with a pinch of salt just because he was um, a performer and a, a storyteller even about himself. Yeah. By the way, Max von Sydow was 28 uh, when this film was wow. shot. <laughs> wow. It's amazing because he's, he's so craggly he's so good. looking. Wow. Um, in particular, the, I, my favorite scene of acting with him is the scene where he's watching the witch about to be burned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and he's really, like contorting his face. Yeah, and yeah. It's yeah. really intense. Yeah, um, great performance. So we have to talk about the fact that the Vatican, uh, this film, on the Vatican film list, right, there are three categories Religion, art, and values. This film is included in the values section, which is like the most non-apparent like place to put it to uh-huh. me. Like this, this you described it as it's like teetering on the edge of nihilism. Values? What? What? What do we think of that? Yeah. Well, usually it seems like when they include a list in the values section, it means they approve of the values on some level. But what values? I'm not sure. Well, I I think... Yeah, because even if you said it deals with philosophical and religious issues, it doesn't really... It's not really about values in any sense. Like, values usually refers to, like, morals or, like, virtues or something. Like, there's no values in this film. It's just, like, questions. I I, I think that... The, there's a couple of ways I, I think I would parse that. One is the commitment to truth that is clearly on display in this film, that both in the discussions of the artist and also Bergman's own commitment to just showing everything as as it is, as closely as he can. Like mm-hmm. I mean, there's that fascinating and really disturbing sequence in the bar in which the the in the village in which villagers go from worrying about death and spouting superstitious nonsense, basically. To um, partake in and enjoying the humiliation of of Yof, um, the the traveling player, and I mean, there's there's something about that sequence which just it just it's bitter, but it it kind of rings true. Like he just he will not turn away. That's the impression that I get of Bergman. He he's visited by angels and demons, and he can't but help himself put them on the screen as truly as he can. Mm. I mean, then I think on that on as a result of that, I think that there are certain values displayed which are 
distinctly humanizing and faithful. I mean, I really would think that the uh, aspect of Mia and Yof, like whatever their, their sort of their personal failings, I do think they demonstrate or they signify or they symbolize a kind of healthy faith and a healthy humanity. And I mean, then I know that Bergman talked about his own belief about um, once you sort of strip away theology, you get to the holiness of the human being, and that's always there. And I mean, I think, again, he does have a concrete belief in that. He, he does try hmm. and express that. And I mean, the, the seeker, the knight, even though he's quite a passive character, he, he is an earnest and an honest seeker. Even if he doesn't find God necessarily, he, he, he sort of desperately wants uh, either to, to know or not to know. He just, he can't quite bring himself to that, as I say, that sort of act of receptivity, that feminine virtue, that, that faith. Um, so I don't know, I, 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 it's funny, I come away from this film feeling quite hopeful, um, which is perhaps not what most people would, mm. and perhaps it's because when you watch something like A Winter Light, you really see what a world without God is like, because um, in that, the, 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 one of the key the main characters, Max von Sydow's character, kills himself after talking to the pastor, and there's this really bizarre exchange between them in which you almost get the sense that the pastor can see the rationality of your man's desire to commit suicide. And like that's sort of that's the world without God. That's that's truly where it went to. And I mean, this is something that there's um, uh, Frank Duff, a guy that I've been reading a lot about. He's uh, I think he's either a servant of God or, or similar. But I don't know. Do you know the Legion of Mary, the organization? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The organization. So he yeah. founded that. Quite a prominent Irish figure or figure in the Irish Church. But he was uh, also quite a profound Marian theologian and. Um, but one of the things he talks about is he had this experience when he was praying one day in a church of about 10 minutes where he truly felt what it was like to believe or to live in a world where you don't believe that there's any God. And he said it was just insupportable. It was insupportable grief and suffering, basically. And I mean, I think in the end, what comes through in A Seventh Seal is that that childish aspect of faith, that vestige is still there. There's still something supportable about life, as it were. There's still something bearable which is sort of that the imago day just in some sense and i mean it's worth watching winter light just to contrast that when there just isn't and it's a really depressing and um uh, quite boring film as a result it's interesting that you bring that up and i hate to do this but there's actually a pretty major essential scene in this film that we haven't touched on at all yet uh which is the scene where they're eating the strawberries yeah and well the milk. this is the perfect time to yeah, touch on it yeah why, why uh, would we have touched on it before yeah yeah um yeah so uh yeah just didn't want to like interrupt the seeming wrap up that no was no it, 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 right, to the contrary actually we're, we're getting there because okay, you know every time i've watched this movie i also um have been encouraged in my own way because in the picture of yoff and mia and mikhail i just see like the paradigm like oh man that is the life i can't tell you how many times i've like this this uh the image of that family in the the wagon, you know, traveling and doing their performances has just come back to me uh, as I discern my own choices in life. You know, it's almost like uh, hmm. a, uh, a a picture that you know I can I can take with me. Not unlike what the knight's character says uh, during that scene that you're referring to right. where they're having this picnic, he says, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to this memory. It's a beautiful scene and it's yes. probably my favorite in the whole it film. It is a beautiful scene. It's very pastoral, very warm, but like there's, this, so there's this, they're eating strawberries and milk and, uh, he kind of like is talking about this experience. Like you said, he's like, I'm going to remember this. It's going to be a sign for me. And like, bring me great content and and you know all of my questions about god and stuff don't seem real when i'm with you and your husband and he kind of like there's this very like sacramental like mm-hmm. yeah. he's got this big bowl of milk that he's drinking at he's, he's like raising it in like a very solemn right. kind of way so like every person that i've read have, 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 commenting on this has compared it to being like a sacramental yeah scene uh but um i don't know so there's there's the possibility that it's like this humanism though, like that, that Bergman is offering us like the consolation that it's similar to like what Yun says, which is that like repeatedly in the film, which is that like, it doesn't matter. You just have to like 
like enjoy like the triumphant feeling of being alive in this moment even though you're about to die and there might be nothing afterwards yeah uh where like this is like i don't know ray danis in his review refers to it as being like possibly kind of like an anti-sacrament which is that like it's this humanistic like this is all we have so let's enjoy it Hmm. and like forget about these questions you know for a Hmm. while kind of thing Mm -hmm. uh where it's like a counterpoint to to the search right i think an alternative way of looking at that sequence is that he's experiencing peace for one of the only times he's ever experienced peace right Mm -hmm. you know that like what he describes as those questions no no longer mattering anymore is can perhaps be understood as the experience of of receptivity you know this like this very thing that we've kind of hit on as 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 being his uh his fatal flaw that he's he's clenched up and not open that in this moment with with Yoff on the lyre and Mikael asleep and eating these strawberries he's just on the receiving end of a gift mm-hmm. and that you know he might not be able to totally link this together back to god but that nonetheless he's he's tasting the peace that comes from faith hmm. um yeah like I, yeah because i i go ahead yeah i mean just jump because i i i actually haven't read great house's review but i mean i i can see what he means about the idea of it being anti-sacrament and a humanist ceremony in some sense but i i don't know i quite quite go as far as to say it's an anti-sacrament it's certainly a a sacrament it's it's hinty at the sacraments but it's like a a sacramental vision without god so i mean in that sense is it an anti-sacrament perhaps but i i don't know that it necessarily sets it, it necessarily completes or manages to set itself up as that even if it wants to be just because i do think that in the end yof and mia manage to travel through life with a degree of faithfulness and levity which is um both attractive and humane but also i think linked through through sort of Bergman's visions of women and and how those um, connect to his his view of faith and also through Yoff's visions I do think it has a slightly more Christian tint to it than than an anti-sacrament yeah it might fail to be right, because like you were but it looks towards it right you were saying that you kind of wish that the knight would just sit down and talk with Yoff right but this is but that's not really what Yoff is about, mm, you right, know? He's right. not about sitting around and having these conversations. What he shares with him instead is yeah. this moment of peace, this real yeah. gift of family life and of, of love. Right. And and so I think that uh, you know, what when 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 Max von Sydow's character goes to the uh woman, the y- young lady who's being burned for being a witch. And he asks her to show him the devil. She says, yeah, I can show you. Look into my eyes. Mm-hmm. Do you not see him? You know, there's. it's kind of like the inverse of that with mm. Yoff and Mia here together, having this meal, inviting people to be with them. You're, you're, there's an experience of God. You know, God is there, mm-hmm. maybe not in, explicitly, yeah. But um but but Yoff gets up and starts playing a song. You know, he's humming it along, he's not singing the words, but every word of every song we've heard him sing has been a a hymn, a, an ode. It's been something yeah. to to Jesus. Yeah. So except so, for that one performance that they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well that's you know, he's not the director. Yeah. Um <laughs> but you know, so it's like uh uh I, I think that that and and it's it's really beautifully laid out because you've got the 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 blanket down and they're all sitting around it the, they're framed very nicely and then what's very cool is that in the background there's the mask of death mm-hmm. uh just on like the the back of the the wagon or on a peg or something so even death is represented in this mm-hmm. tableau you know so even death sort of is there in the background is is it's not it's not an escape from death like death is integrated into this scene as well mm-hmm. I, I think yeah it's inter- yeah i think that's a fair point I, it's important that yoff 
never says anything to kind of undermine his character's like supernatural orientation. You like, you know, because you can like, I don't know, I've seen characters in modern, you know, dramas that are like, they're kind of like the simple, peaceful character who's kind of like, at root, kind of like a humanist, a secularist or whatever, like he's kind of like the, 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 uh, I, I don't know, I wish I could think of an example, but, but he could have, he could have given him like a line that kind of says, hey, oh, I don't care about these questions, you know, like they don't really matter. What matters is, you know, just living your life or, you know, he never has him say anything like that or he never has him right. like indicate that he's like sort of indifferent. No, he doesn't like indicate that he's like, you know, a devout christian exactly but he's just it's more that he like takes everything simply yeah and he is like as you said receptive to everything so he's singing these songs about about christ and uh it doesn't seem to have any particular relationship to the church but it is like this just this simple integrated he's almost like the perfect medieval character in this yeah. in this story right like like because we've got the uh you know we we have plenty of different simple people in this story but a lot of them are vulgar and kind of like cruel as you mentioned the people in the tavern or yeah yoff is kind of like that ideal of the un he's kind of like the the ideal of the uneducated christian yeah in a way sure. uh, yeah and like the, there's there's a couple of things for that scene that i just pick out as well which is one that they're the only that because they're the only people depicted with a child they're in a certain sense the only people committed to the future um like this this is a, a film that mm -hmm. really takes place in a in a dream landscape without a strong sense of time but if you if you have a child then you are committed to time as it were to incarnate reality in a, in a far more concrete way than any of the rest of the characters are they can all sort of be seekers mm -hmm. and be uh, cynics and the like because they never really commit themselves to anything whereas this this couple, um, Mary and Joseph, have committed themselves to new life. And I mean, look, I don't think it's it's a, it's a perfect sacramental scene or anything in the way that, say, something like Babette's Feast, the final sequence in that, hints towards a, a, a sacrament. I don't think it's as complete a vision as that. Um, but I, I certainly think it, it hints at, at something of a sacramental vision and something, again, of that, that childish faith that presumably, I mean, in, in a context of, of a severe sort of Lutheranism lacked um, that sacramental, a true sacramental capacity, and also lacked the incarnate, the, the mother of the church and our mother, that incarnational aspect in, in a more natural sense. Hmm. Amen. Well, was there was there anything else that you wanted to hit on before we wrap up? I think I think that that was great, but uh, I no, not for me. I, other... I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, thank you for inviting me um, in to discuss it. This is my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And my, my wife will be greatly relieved that I, I don't pester about these things if I find another outlet for my ideas. Yeah, Rowan, thank you very, very much for coming on the show and talking with us. Um, I think that uh, this I, I think that we've done yeoman's work here because uh, <laughs> You what know, is a yeoman, by the way. Uh, who knows? Probably, <laughs> probably, we, we probably saw uh, several of them yeah. in the end of the film. <laughs> probably. Um, yeah. But, uh, but no, you know, I think that uh, if you were to watch this film and dismiss it as nihilistic, if you were to scoff at the Vatican's inclusion of this film on the Vatican film list, especially in the section of values, I think you're you're missing out. But you know, you scratch the surface some more and sit with this film. There's there's really a lot to dig into. And uh, yeah, we'll have to have you back uh, to talk about the rest of Bergman's work whenever we uh, get around to it. You <laughs> no, know? No, 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 no. At some point, we're going to, yeah. At some point, we're going to have to move off of this Vatican film list and then mm -hmm. what wait till, will there be wait to till do? Wait till we get but... to like Persona and Fanny and Alexander because those are just mesmerizing. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, oh, can you just let our listeners know where they can find you? Oh, yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Ruan J, I think I am. Um, and then the Catholic Index is catholicindex.wordpress.com, I think. Um, but, yeah, uh, your name, and that's spelled R U A D H A N. Yeah, so because -A -D -H -A otherwise people would say yeah. R U O N. Yeah, yeah, it's, wouldn't it's, find you. it's um, good old Irish. But yeah, um, so feel free to follow. Uh, I do, in my capacity as journalist, I tweet more newsy stuff, but the Catholic Index tweets more filmy 
Uh, James, do you want to tell people about the fall campaign? Yeah. So if you've listened this long, then you can bear to listen a little longer while I explain to you that we are in the midst of our fall fundraising campaign at catholicculture.org. It's the biggest fundraiser of the year. It really is what determines whether we're able to continue into 2022 or not. Uh, Good news is that we've got a $105,000 challenge grant. Certain key donors have come together and set this matching grant as a challenge for other donors. If we can match this, then we'll get all of that money. Um, if we can't match it, we lose it all. So it's really, it's really double or nothing. Um, so if you've been thinking about giving, uh, but haven't done so yet, now is a perfect time. Any amount that you give helps. It'll be helping us reach our goal. But as soon as we do, it'll count twice because uh, your, your gift will be doubled. So um, uh, head over to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. And your gift will be specifically earmarked to help with the production of this show and any other of our podcast offerings. Um, so again, that's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone.